This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Is this what democracy looks like? Anarchists might use democratic methods, but we don't let democracy use us. For us, the first and last matter is always the needs and feelings of the individuals involved. Any system to address them is provisional at best. We don't try to force ourselves into the confines of any established procedures. We apply procedures to the extent that they serve human needs and discard them past that point. Seriously, what should come first, our systems or us? We cooperate or coexist with others, including other life forms, whenever it's possible, but we don't prize consensus, let alone the rule of law, above our own values and dreams. When we can't come to an agreement, we go our own ways, rather than limiting each other. In extreme cases, when others refuse to acknowledge our needs or persist in doing unconscionable, harmful things, we intercede by whatever means are necessary, not on behalf of justice or revenge, but simply to represent our own interests. We see laws as nothing more than the shadows of our predecessors' customs, lengthened by the years to seem wiser than our own judgment. They persist as undead creatures, imposing unnatural stipulations upon us that do not enable justice, but only interfere with it, while at the same time estranging us from it, framing it as something we cannot carry out without arcane formalities and judges' wigs. These laws, having multiplied and calcified over time, are now so alien and inscrutable that a priest class of lawyers makes a living off the rest of us as astrologers of the stars our well-meaning ancestors set in precarious orbit. The man who insists that justice can only be maintained by the rule of law is the same one who appears on the witness stand at the war crime tribunal swearing he was only following orders. There is no justice. There is just us. The Economics of Anarchy Anarchist economies are radically different from other economies. Anarchists not only conduct their transactions differently, but trade in an entirely different currency, a currency that is not convertible into the kind of assets for which capitalists compete and communists draft five-year plans. Capitalists, Socialists, Communists exchange products. Anarchists interchange assistance, inspiration, loyalty. Capitalist, socialist, communist economies make human interactions into commodities. Policing, medical care, education, even sexual relations become services that are bought and sold. Anarchist economies, focusing above all on the needs and desires of the individuals involved, transform products back into social relations. The communal experience of gardening or gathering berries or playing music, the excitement of looting a supermarket or occupying a building. The typical economic interaction in capitalist relations is the sale. In anarchist economics, it is the gift. Anarchist economies depend on commons, which are the opposite of private property. Private capital disappears when utilized, as in the case of money spent by day laborers on food, or when enough of it accrues, it serves to accrue more private capital at others' expense, as in the case of the corporation that exploits those laborers. Commons, on the other hand, are available in abundance, and the more they are utilized, the more abundant they become. The community garden that produces more food, the more people cooperate in it. The squatted building that is better renovated for community usage and better defended from the police, the more people commit to it. In friendships, as in lovemaking, as in potluck dinners and dancing, the more one gives, the more everyone gets. Today, most of us participate in both kinds of economies at once. Ostensibly private property is still shared, at least in limited contexts. A teenager brings his basketball for the neighborhood game, a rock band buys a communal van. Even a house belonging to a middle-class family, although off-limits for most, still hosts visiting relatives, a PTA meeting, a sleepover party. Instances like these are reminders of how much more pleasurable sharing can be than commerce. Anarchists nurture visions of a world suitable for sharing that knows no borders. But who will take out the garbage? It was in Barcelona, some years after the Civil War, when the memory of the syndicates still remained, unutterable under the iron heel of the fascist regime. City bus number 68 was making its rounds one particularly sunny spring day, when the driver slammed on the brakes at an intersection. 
Fuck this, he swore in angry Catalan, and opening the bus doors, stomped out into the sunshine. The passengers watched in shock at first, and then began to protest anxiously. One of them stood up and started to honk the horn. After a few tentative beeps, he leaned on it with all his might, sounding it like a burglar alarm, but the fed-up ex-bus driver continued nonchalant on his way down the street. For a full minute, the rider sat in stupefied silence. A couple stood up and got off the bus themselves. Then, from the back of the bus, a woman with an appearance of a huge cannonball and an air of unconquerable self-possession stepped forward. Without a word, she sat down in the driver's seat and put the engine in gear. The bus continued on its route, stopping at its customary stops, until the woman arrived at her own and got off. Another passenger took her place for a stretch, stopping at every bus stop, and then another, and another, and so number 68 continued until the end of the line. It means figuring out how to work together to meet our individual needs, working with each other rather than for or against each other, and when this is impossible, it means preferring strife to submission and domination. It means not valuing any system or ideology above the people it purports to serve not valuing anything theoretical above the real things in this world. It means being faithful to real human beings and animals and ecosystems, fighting for ourselves and beside each other, not out of responsibility, not for causes, or other intangible concepts. It means denying that there is any universal standard of truth, aesthetics, or morality, and contesting wherever it appears the doctrine that life is essentially one-dimensional. It means not forcing your desires and experiences into a hierarchical order, but acknowledging and embracing all of them, accepting yourself. It means not trying to compel the self to abide by any external laws, not trying to restrict your emotions to the sensible or the practical or the political, not pushing your instincts and passions into boxes, for there is no cage large enough to accommodate the human soul in all its flights, all its heights and depths. It means seeking a way of life which gives free play to all your conflicting inclinations in the process of continuously challenging and transforming them. It means not privileging any one moment of life over the others, not languishing in nostalgia for the good old days, or waiting for tomorrow, or for that matter, the revolution, for real life to begin, but seizing and creating it in every instance. Yes, of course it means treasuring memories and planning for the future. It also means remembering that there is no time happiness, resistance, life ever happens but now, now, now. It means refusing to put the responsibility for your life in anyone else's hands, whether that be parents, lovers, employers, or society itself. It means taking the pursuit of meaning and joy in your life upon your own shoulders. Above all, it means not accepting this or any manifesto or definition as it is, but making and remaking it for yourself. Civic Hedonism What's good for others is good for us, since our relationships with them make up the world in which we live. But serving their needs at our own expense would cheat them of our potential as free and happy companions, which is perhaps the best gift we can offer. Our vision of healthy relationships rests on the notion that self versus other, selfish versus selfless, is a false dichotomy like all dichotomies. Those who preach self-sacrifice for the greater good are still working from the competitive model of individual versus society, as are those who would aspire to an individualist independence. For us, individuals and communities alike are both convergences of threads in the great web of existence, inseparable from one another, corresponding to one another. The freedom and self-determination we cherish are only possible in the context of the culture we create together, yet in order to contribute to that creation, we must create ourselves individually. That is, if you can save yourself, you could save the world, but you must save the world to save yourself. A fellowship of friends and lovers. As anarchists propose that friendship, or at least family ties, could be the model for all relationships, we prize above all those qualities which make good friendships possible. Reliability, generosity, gentleness. Most of us have been indoctrinated into hierarchy and contention since we were born, and that makes it no small feat to interact in ways that liberate and enable more than cripple. Still, it happens all the time. Each of us tries to give without demanding in return, to be a person with whom no one must feel ashamed. It's been said that we are against marriage, but the opposite is true. 
Yes, we emphasize that no one is the property of another, but even more so that everybody on this planet is already permanently intertwined, and we insist that everyone act accordingly. All this is not to say we approach soldiers with flowers when they come for our children, nor do we offer corporations our children when they come for our flowers. Sometimes love can only speak through the barrel of a gun. Self-determination begins at home. Not to be forced by expectation, doctrine, or necessity to claim one fragment of yourself and disown others, not to take sides within and against yourself, not to play judge and jury constantly at your own trial, not to protect pristine ignorance with inaction, but to learn from mistakes and thus grow wise, not to choose one path in life and follow it to the exclusion of all others, but to throw false unity and consistency to the wind, to give expression to every impulse and yearning in what you deem its proper time, and appreciate what is fertile in turmoil. To do this knowing you are part of a community that cherishes you unconditionally, and to cherish others in their entirety as they reflect parts of yourself. To live without the petty squabbles of pecking order and power structure inside any more than around, that is the anarchist dream of selfhood. Direct action gets the goods. A community in which people direct their own activities and look out for each other does not need a prison or a factory built in it to, quote, create jobs. A community of people who share their own channels of communication are not at the mercy of any corporate media's version of truth. A community of people who make their own music and art and organize their own social events would never settle for the paralyzing spectacle of reality television, let alone computer dating services and pornography. A community of people who know each other's histories and understand each other's needs can work through conflicts without any need for interference from uniformed strangers with guns. The extent to which we can create these communities is the extent to which we can solve the problems we face today, and no legislation or charity will do this for us. Institutions can only be as good as the people who make them work, and they usually aren't anyhow. Solutions, quote, from above, have proved ineffective over and over. The red tape of medical programs, the inefficiency of social services, the lies of presidents. If you don't trust the people, you can be sure you can't trust the police. All gods, all masters. Anarchism is aristocratic. Anarchists just insist that the elite should consist of everyone, that the struggle of the, quote, common man can become the struggle of the uncommon woman and men it produces. We have no illusions that there are any shortcuts to anarchy. We don't seek to lead, quote, the people, but to establish a nation of sovereigns. We don't seek to be a vanguard of theorists, but to empower a readership of authors. We don't seek to be the artists of a new avant-garde, but to enable an audience of performers. We don't so much seek to destroy power as to make it freely available in abundance. We want to be masters without slaves. We recognize that power struggles and dynamics will always be part of human life. Many of us have a tyrannical muse we obey, albeit willingly, so we reserve even the right to command and serve when it pleases us. But as they say, the only free human beings are the pauper and the king, the king being the less free of the two, since his kingdom still encumbers and limits him. While on her luckier days, the hobo can feel that the whole of the cosmos exists for the sake of her pleasure and freedom. So we prefer not to trivialize ourselves by competing for such fool's gold as ownership or authority. And when struggle is unavoidable, we would still prefer to be at the mercy of the violence and stupidity of other individuals than the violence and stupidity of humanity as it is distilled and marshaled by the state. We are not egalitarians in the old sense. We are not out to pull the rich and powerful down to, quote, our level. Rather, we pity them for not being ambitious enough in their aspirations, and hope they will abdicate to join us in fighting to make it possible for everyone to ascend to greatness. That way, we won't have to guillotine them. We're not against the glory assigned to pop icons and movie stars, per se. We just deplore the way it is squandered on distant objects, when it rightfully belongs to the moments of our own heroic lives. We are not against the homage and devotion that the monotheist's God receives. We simply find it healthier to devote it to each other. We are not against property, exactly, so much as we are the pettiness of bickering over it. For we understand that to rule the world, we must share it all, and not demolish or meddle with it for that matter. 
the true pauper king walks the forests of his domain proudly watching the interactions of the complex ecosystems in awe knowing the only appropriate conduct for a monarch of such a wonderland is a policy of veneration and non-intervention except to thwart the occasional logging corporation we're not waiting for the revolution to give us the rights we deserve deeming ourselves the highest authorities we need recognize we grant them to ourselves immediately and therefore make revolution constantly as a way to assert and protect them we will settle for nothing less than total world domination for one and all and every god an atheist Anarchists not only deny the authority of God, chief of police of the universe, but also maintain a healthy distrust of his successors, nature, history, science, morality. We don't account any being, system, or tradition the right to our unquestioning faith, since even when we esteem others' knowledge or judgment better than our own, we are still responsible for the choice to trust them. Accordingly, we don't regard any contention or assumption as above dispute, and revel more in moving freely between paradigms than in debating which one is the truth. We are especially suspicious of experts who would mediate between us and deities or spheres of knowledge, and prefer both to learn about the world and to contact the divine for ourselves. Justice as judgment we count of little worth. We want to be practical, to solve problems, not to treat human relations and conduct as another economic exchange with righteousness for currency. We apply the idea of personal responsibility only to the extent that it is useful in making our relationships work. Otherwise, it is of little interest to us whether a person's soul is damned or redeemed, whether conduct is moral or immoral, whether society or the individual is to blame for a wrong. Let it not be said about us that we hold nothing holy. On the contrary, we hold everything holy. Denying hierarchy means venerating the singular, incomparable beauty of every creature, every feature of the cosmos, every moment. Only appraisal and condemnation are anathema to us. The anarchist is a very fierce creature. It is first cousin to the gorilla. It kills presidents, princes, executives, likewise sabotages their summits and summer holidays. It has long, unkempt hair on its head and all over its face. Instead of fingernails, it has long, sharp claws. The anarchist has many pockets in which it carries rocks, knives, guns, and bombs. It is a night animal. After dark, it gathers in groups, large and small, and plans raids, murders, plagues. Lots are drawn to select who must carry out the work. The anarchist does not like water. It never washes or changes its clothes. It is always thirsty and drinks only salt water. The home of the anarchist is in Europe, especially Italy. Some few have been exported to North America, where they are feared and hated by all decent folks and hunted wherever they show themselves. Papa does not like anarchists a bit. They give him bad dreams, he says. He has given orders to have them caught and put in cages, and he will not allow any more to come into this country if he can help it. If any sneak in, he will have them shot like rabid dogs, Mexicans, mountain lions, and such animals. I practice every day with my rifle so I can shoot these wild beasts when I grow up. A White House Nursery Composition, 1904 Against Gross Generalizations all of us have grown up divided and conquered along lines of gender and sexual preference, body type and ethnicity, class and race, bought off with privileges and beaten down with psychological warfare, so we'll do our parts to keep the pecking order in place. White supremacy, patriarchy, and heterosexism are the pillars of this civilization. We anarchists fight against these oppressive structures, whether we find them in society or ourselves, but we aim for more than the liberation of human beings of all identities. We want the liberation of all human beings from identity. There are no universals. Group identities are self-perpetuating fabrications that begin with circumstantial evidence and end by imposing a false uniformity. There are two genders, for example, like there are, quote, only twelve tones in every octave. It seems true when you look at a piano, but try opening your mouth and singing. 
Though femininity may appear ordained by nature to those who grew up in environments where all women shaved their legs and armpits, it is just a generalization drawn from generations of standardized behavior, reinforced by each replication. But, as there is no pure femininity, no substance the generalization refers to besides what all the individual instances are perceived to have in common, and so each generation is not the original but a copy, the entire paradigm is at risk in every new generation, as it may be transformed or abandoned. At best, generalizations like class and gender can be used to undo themselves, to expose and confront the patterns of oppression that run through individual lives, to find common cause in fighting the invisibility of certain experiences and histories. We want to get beyond these and all categories and conflicts, but it's only going to happen if we begin by addressing them. In men's groups, human beings constructed as men can exchange skills for rewiring their programming. In women-only spaces, those constructed as women can explore similarly without the presence of men interfering. We defend the right of individuals to choose how they want to be identified, and no vision of unbounded life is any excuse to pretend the world is yet free anywhere from power imbalances. But ultimately, it is revolution we are after, not reform. We're not petitioning for more rights for special interest groups or more freedom of movement between established categories. We're taking and making our right to make and remake ourselves in every moment and wrecking the system of divisions in the process. We are feminists who would abolish gender, labor organizers who would abolish work, artists fighting to destroy and transcend art. Our class war is a war against class, against classes, and classification. When we say that we are against representation, we do not only mean representative, quote, democracy. We also mean that each of us is an irreducible individual, that none can speak for another. Neither politicians, nor abstractions, neither delegates, nor demographics can represent us. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.